So joining, joining us today are Sandy Springman, who describes herself, I love this, as a junior planetary defender at the Arecibo Observatory, so welcome, and David Dickinson, who most of you know is from Universe Today. Hey, what's up? So we've got a lot of interesting um, space-ish news to discuss today. Um, we've got some comets, we've got pieces of mirror that might not be pieces of mirror, um, some new missions from China, some upcoming launches. Cassini and the um, what NASA is now calling the Asteroid Redirection Program. So since a lot of this is coming from David, we're going to start with David. Okay. Um, do you want to start with Comet Ison and Volvo? Yeah, yeah. In space? I, uh, Comet Ison is the much uh, anticipated comet of the century that's going to come by later this year, and there's a lot of discussion as far as what it's actually going to do. Now I caught up with John Bortle, who is a is an expert. Uh, observer of comets, and he's been writing about comets for. I first saw an article by him in Sky and Telescope on Prospects Rice, and so I emailed him back and forth, and we talked a little bit about what Ison is going to do, and is it, it, it is it actually going to be the comet of the century, or is it going to be another Kohotek? Where back in the 70s, you remember those of us old enough to remember Kohotek, where it was everybody thought this is going to be like one of the brightest comets ever, and you know comets. I think it was David Levy said comets are like cats. They have tails and they do exactly what they want. So a lot of times when comets come by, sometimes they come by and surprise us. I think one of the biggest surprises I remember was Hayakutaki in, in the uh, late 90s. That kind of literally came out of nowhere, and within a few months it was a bright comet. Uh, Hale Bop came by only a few months after that. That was another bright comet. But there's also been comets like Comet Elenin that broke up a few years ago that was supposed to be a very bright comet that never was in Kohotek too. Now, he thinks, and I kind of concur on this, too. We've been talking back and forth. There's been a lot of talk about Ison underperforming. It's really too early to tell right now because it's out between Mars and Jupiter beyond the, uh, in the area of the asteroid belt. It's down about 16th magnitude, which is about 10,000 times fainter than naked eye magnitude, around 6 magnitude. And it's really too early to tell what Ison is going to do right now. Ison is going behind the sun here in a couple months, and it's going. It's in the constellation Gemini right now, and we're not going to get another good look at it until late August when it comes back around. Now, the really interesting time is right about October when it comes in past the orbit of Mars. Uh, it's no threat to Mars or Earth. It's not coming anywhere near Mars or Earth. So anybody that thinks it's going to hit, it's not. Uh, at that time, when it comes in by, it's going to start brightening. Now, he thinks it's not going to reach naked eye visibility until about two weeks prior to perihelion on November 28th. And it's going to pass a very close perihelion, and that may be the key right there is, is it going to survive that perihelion? A lot of sun-grazing comets, they go in and they don't come out. Uh, in 2011, we had Comet Lovejoy, which actually came in by the sun and actually survived its perihelion within a few, I believe, 100,000 kilometers from the surface of the sun. Surprised everybody. We were watching it online, talking about it on Twitter, and it actually became a very bright southern hemisphere comet. Now, if Ison repeats that, we may have a bright comet in the weeks leading up to Christmas this year, a bright naked eye comet in the morning skies going out through the constellation Ophiuchus. Another scenario is Ison may go in and never come out. So that might be a scenario right there where there's a lot of internet hype around it and then Ison just disintegrates and is no more than a good binocular comet and no one ever gets a really good look at it. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting. Uh, later this summer, the interest is really going to ramp up on this one. And I suspect that there's going to be a lot of controversy about how bright it is once it comes back around the sun and, and Hubble and everything gets a look at it again. So... I just have a sort of a question about controversies surrounding comets. I mean, I, I kind of imagine there's all sorts of, you know, people have their own ideas of what it's going to look like and, and what yeah. it, you know, what it means that there's a comet coming close to the sun or whatnot. I mean, what, what are sort of the stranger things in terms of internet rumors that you, you sort of <laughs> predict seeing I, surrounding I, comet? I, I actually, I actually did write, uh, there was enough rumors going around. Nancy, Nancy Atkinson at Universe Today uh, pegged me to write an article about a lot of these controversies. So I did some research on it. There's talk, it's kind of, we're kind of getting a hail bop redux, redux from a, over a decade ago where there's already been people that have been saying that things are following hail bop or NASA's covering up things with, or not hail bop, but the same thing as uh, what sparked the whole Heaven's Gate uh, mass suicide back in the 90s where they thought 
it came on uh, late night with Art Bell. They were talking about where there was UFO behind the comet. I've already seen that with ice and. Uh, if you look at the videos on YouTube that are talking about this, where they're looking at the Hubble frames and stuff, it's obvious it's a hot pixel in the frame. You see that a lot on, on a lot of different... I get hot pixels on DSLR images, where you're just seeing things, spurious things that aren't there. There's already been talk about uh, people are resurrecting the Biru again from uh, 2012 controversy about the end of the world, about there's some kind of hypothetical inbound object out there that astronomers are covering up that's supposed to be like coming in to the inner solar system again. We are, we are covering it up. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I've already been told I was I'm... I was thinking of wearing my Nibiru shirt today, actually. Some friends of the South Pole Telescope sent it to Hey, Nibiru made a, uh, 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 it came in on the new Star Trek movie. I couldn't believe that right at the intro of the movie. It's a tiny spoiler there, but I was like, no way. That's what they actually named the planet. I was, like, I was <laughs> so excited <laughs> when they mentioned that. Yeah. I was like, that's too funny. They mentioned Nibiru and Cold Fusion almost in the same sentence in the intro of the movie. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> there's, there's actually, there was a conspiracy theory, I think, last year uh, that, Arecibo Observatory was observing Nibiru, and there's all these videos posted online <laughs> of Arecibo Observatory and this Planet well, X thing. And it's like, well, that that's not covered under our grant. We, we've already been told at uh, Universe Today that we're shills for big NASA, basically. So as if NASA has the funding Obviously. to shill to pay bloggers to cover <laughs> these kind of things. So. <laughs> Well, let's, uh, I'm going to make an awkward segue here. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of covering things up and things that may or may not be something, David, you had another interesting one in that somebody claims to have found a piece of mirror. Yeah, this, this came around in last weekend, and a bunch of us that do uh, satellite tracking and amateur satellite sleuthing and observing satellites kind of scratched our heads when we saw this one. There was a man came up on the local news and kind of made its its rounds around the internet. There was a man in Innsbury, Massachusetts, that had a looked like a vitreous piece of melted glass, like slag, and he had said in the article that he had he told the local news that he had found this while he was searching for arrowheads in the local river, and it kind of sat around his backyard for a while till a friend of his said, "Why don't you send that off to NASA and get it analyzed." Now, he found it about six years ago. He sent it off about a year ago and got it back a few weeks ago and said that he was told that it was actually a piece of the space station mirror. Uh, if you look at it, it looks like a rock. <laughs> now, we did some research on this because a lot of us, a mirror was well known to have re-entered over the South Pacific. I mean, there's, you can see the YouTube videos. It's, uh, it's been well observed and known to re-enter way, way far away from Massachusetts over the South Pacific in 2001. Where he got this confirmation is kind of odd. I called around and did some research. I called NASA to their space debris micrometeoroid uh, office, and they said, we never confirmed this at all. And there was another name that came up. This person doesn't want their name revealed at NASA. That His name was used in the article a few times. I actually tracked him down and emailed him, and he said, no, I'm kind of tired of answering this this week, but I didn't confirm this was a piece of anything. So I... It's, I think the guy might have something. I don't know if somebody's pulling his leg or not. I don't know if it's you now. If it shows up on eBay, I would say it's an outright hoax. I don't know what his motivation would be to hoax this. Uh, we did some research on different uh, re-entries during the Mir era, looking at different progress vehicles in different Russian launches. There, there were a few observed re-entries in the 90s and in the early 2000s that could have matched up to this. Uh, what I'd like to know from Roscosmos, and I did email them, uh, what they used for ballast, because there was talk about that maybe this was a piece of ballast that was... I'm not surprised if they use rocks or glass or something in a Russian launch for ballast to weight the, the launch somehow, but I've not got an answer back on that. But it's, it's, a, it's an intriguing story somehow. I don't know exactly what he has. I don't think it's a piece of mirror, though. David, this is a really silly question. Why would you yeah. be using ballast on a rocket a in space? Yeah, just to, I, just to I, balance it? I mean... Rockets I, I guess, are heavy, right? You want to minimize possible. weight. You would think you would want as, as little mass as possible. Yeah, I don't know everything about rocket launches. Again, I, I queried uh, Roscosmos on that, and they didn't get back on me. But it's uh, uh, I, because there's some articles that say this is 85% certain that this is a piece of a rocket launch. Now, it's, I can't... Nobody verified that. Uh, NASA wasn't the ones. I think it might be the case that maybe he had sent this off to somebody to verify it. And, and we get this at Universe Today sometimes, too. They figure 
you write about space, you must be connected to NASA. Everybody's space is NASA. So it might be the case that he had somebody else that, that uh, verified it, and they, they, the local news just said NASA verified, but NASA didn't verify. Right. Um, yeah, that's a weird one, because I don't, uh, usually they don't take something like rocks that would, you know, possibly yeah, I mean, fall to Earth and, and hit people or kill things, because when, when NASA was launching early Saturn V and Saturn 1B launches, they used uh, I think they used water and dummy spacecraft as ballast just to kind of calibrate the launch vehicle properly. But that's, yeah, that's a good yeah. question about why you'd need that ballast would, now. <laughs> you, you would think you would want to dump all that as, yeah. as far as all that weight. But, you know, it's, like I said, I, I don't, I, I'm stopping short of saying it's an outright hoax unless there's a motivation that the guy tries to sell it or something like that. But I, I think it's more a matter of maybe he's found something that's interesting, but it's, it's definitely not a piece of mirror. Or it might be something from that era of mirror that re-entered, like from one of the progress vehicles. But it's a, again, it's it's a it's an odd tale. Well, you I mean you wrote the odd tale. Well, I just posted the link on the CosmoQuest event page for anyone who wants to read David's story. Uh, what what do you think the odds are of this piece showing up on eBay? <laughs> uh, you know what? I actually did a search and I haven't seen it show up there. So it's uh you know it's I don't know what the odds of it would be, but it's it's the only thing I could think of might be a motivation if somebody was outright hoaxing it. Uh, it's a, there was, I think it was Sputnik 4, there was a re-entry back in the 60s that uh, came in over a town in Wisconsin, I believe it was, and they actually did, this was during the Cold War, so they were very eager to recover any pieces of Russian hardware to analyze it, and there was a melted piece of Sputnik 4 that was recovered over this town in Wisconsin that was identified as a Russian launch, and it's kind of eerily similar to that same story. So, I mean, it's it's not impossible. When you look at Mir and all the Russian launches when they come from Baikonur and the International Space Station, too, it's on a 51.6 degree inclination orbit. So it's passing over everywhere from 51.6 degrees south to north. That's why about 90% of the Earth's population sees those satellites. So it's not impossible that, say, uh, a piece of a Cosmos launch or a booster or a piece of a progress vehicle. There were two launches of progress that we looked at when we did some research on this last week, and that kind of, there was one that re-entered off Newfoundland, and there was one that re-entered on a path that was observed from New Jersey up to Ontario. Uh, those ones, I think that was in 96, was a Cosmos launch, again, not Mir or related to Mir, but a Russian spacecraft. Uh, those re-entries might have fit up to that, but it's uh, again, it's it was interesting how uh, certain news agencies automatically ran with "Man finds a piece of mirror," and that was like, and NASA verifies. That was basically the gist of the story. It's a really good headline. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's a little bit irresistible. Um, all right, well, neat. And I should have mentioned this earlier. Sorry, I'm not used to this. Um, you can leave comments and ask us questions on the CosmoQuest event page on Google Plus, on Twitter using the hashtag Weekly Space Hangout, and. Um, on the YouTube link, which I uh, found, so I can answer those questions. So, um, all right, we're going to go. I don't see anything yet. Um, so let's go on to more things coming from, well, not really coming from space to the Earth, but taking them from space and bringing them closer to the Earth. Uh, Sandy, let's talk about wrangling an asteroid or redirecting it, as the term is now. This is like this is like going PC asteroid capture. I know, right? Like, <laughs> do you want to, you know, it, I have in my notes asteroid retrieval mission. No, it's scratched out to, scratched out to asteroid redirect mission. So on Tuesday, NASA yeah. announced this asteroid grand challenge. There is a public-private partnership. Oh, great. Hold on. They just started pressure washing. No. <laughs> uh, the joys of living somewhere in the tropics where mold gets everywhere if you don't pressure wash it. It was like living in a car wash <laughs> earlier today. This guy. <laughs> anyway, um, so this grand challenge is this idea that you can put out prize money and get people to do cool things, like perhaps bring back an asteroid from out in the a near-Earth asteroid, bring it closer to Earth so you can study it. And prize money, we know this has worked really well in the past. We've seen X Prize recently for uh, the space, uh, getting uh, spacecraft into orbit by uh, private companies. We've seen prize money work really well decades ago. Charles Lindbergh's flight was partially inspired by receiving a prize for flying across the Atlantic. So even though your prize is sometimes less than how much it actually costs to develop a technology, it's a real uh, way to drive innovation. 
So the idea for the ARM, the Asteroid Redirect Mission, would be to bring a, uh, an asteroid closer to Earth so that our next class of astronauts who were just selected uh, would be able to actually visit this asteroid and go study it. Uh, the other idea is to find an asteroid, and this is what the NHATS program, which is like near Earth human spaceflight accessible targets study. So these would be asteroids that are small, these are slow rotators, and they would be uh, moving relatively slowly compared to the Earth, so it would be easy to send a spacecraft to. The other option, though, for having human study asteroids is to actually go find an asteroid that's been well characterized, that's been studied a lot throughout the years, break off a piece of it, and bring it home. Uh, this a robot break off a piece of it and bring it back for uh, astronauts to study. So part of the deal is that you want to find a really slow rotator. If you have an asteroid that's rotating really fast, once every couple of hours, it's going to be hard to grab, to slow down. So the idea is that NASA also wants you to get involved with finding these asteroids. They want you to, t if you've got a small telescope, to take light curves with these telescopes, or uh, light curves with these asteroids. So what is a light curve? If you have a rotating asteroid, I'm going to use my favorite sweet potato as an asteroid analog, because it looks a lot like 1996 HW1, as this asteroid rotates. Right now it's <laughs> reflecting a lot of light at you. As it rotates, it's reflecting a lot less, and more, and less, and so you you won't be able to see an asteroid through your telescope unless you have a radio telescope like ours. But uh, if you can, you'll be able to see the asteroid change in brightness as it changes how much sunlight it reflects. And from that, you can actually get an idea of how fast this asteroid is rotating. And NASA wants that information to say, yeah, these asteroids will be really good human spaceflight targets, or these ones uh, won't necessarily be good uh, to land on or to send a robot to because they're just rotating too fast. And so this is also part of the larger sort of find these space rocks before they find us, as Don Newman says, and as uh, NASA says, prove that we're smarter than the dinosaurs. So right now NASA is really hoping that people will uh, give them concepts, approaches for observing, detecting, and even mitigating the threat of asteroids. And what's interesting is you can actually sort of tie this into Mars missions somehow. A lot of people in the small bodies community are kind of like, Rrr, Mars, we don't, we don't like them, Mars steals all of our money, or our... But the idea eventually with Mars exploration is to get a rock from the surface of Mars and to orbit around Mars and bring it home. So I've heard some rumblings that bringing back an asteroid from the asteroid belt to Earth to study is um, sort of practice for bringing back rocks from Mars. So... That's uh, that's the asteroid update for this week. Sandy, is there is, is there a list of uh, like a short list of, of asteroids they would like to go to and study right now, or have they got that far yet? Um, so for NHATS, you can Google that N H A T S, and, um, and there's a Johns Hopkins study on that. Uh, there's a P list of PHAs, potentially hazardous asteroids, uh, they sort them by the amount of delta V, which is the change in velocity yeah. you would need to get to an asteroid. Yeah. So how much rocket fuel? <laughs> because that's probably going to be the big question, yeah, to get there. That's going to be the big, one of the big questions, is if this thing is moving so much faster than the Earth, how much more are you going to need to speed up to get to it, beyond just a simple home and transfer orbit? So there are a number of lists of asteroids out there. We observe a lot of these. Um, my keyboard tray just decided to fail, but uh, last year we looked at um, da, da, da. we looked at we've looked at about twelve of these human spaceflight targets so far in about the last year or so. So they're is they're it, out there. It, I always wondered if Apophis, when it comes by in twenty twenty nine, is that it, it seems like it's coming close, but is it like moving too fast for us to really? Um, so for how a big is Apophis? Or, I think it's um, a few kilometers, but. I mean, it is a potentially hazardous asteroid, but yeah. it might it might also just be moving too fast, and yeah. it's it's three hundred meters across. So I'm not sure if that's that's probably okay. too big to bring. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably you too that. big to bring home, because <laughs> then you'd have a uh, so yeah three hundred meter. You'd have a three kilometer crater that would yeah. that would uh, that would ruin your day if it crashed into Earth. But you could probably break off a chunk of it. I, I remember when Hayabusa came back with the sample return a few years ago. That was uh, I think it's showing it's it's exponentially more difficult to do that than a lot of people realize. Hayabusa really had to limp home pretty much. Yeah. Well, the other thing about Apophis is it's an S-type of asteroid, uh, and we have a lot of those meteorites. We have uh, we I think it's um it's about seventeen percent of asteroids are S-types. 
So if you're bringing back something like that, it's it's kind of a common one. So there might be yeah. other more, like uh, 1998 QE2 that just came by. That that one that was a couple miles across. It was very dark. It was very primitive. So that's very interesting to study. And if we're gonna bring something home, it should be. That oh, was a great something. animation of the moon and the, the rotation you guys did. Oh, thank cool. you. Yeah, we yeah. there was a lot of all nighters for that. Yeah, that's very cool. So I want to know how bringing an asteroid back from the asteroid belt is supposed to be simpler than bringing back a rock from Mars. Well, Aside from the fact that you have to, you know, obviously lift off from the surface of Mars, isn't it going to be that, that much harder to go that hard. much further and deal with something that's moving that fast, that far from the Earth, get there, wrangle it, get out without smashing into other asteroids? Well, I think it all comes back to rocket fuel at the end of the day. It's really right. hard to get something off the surface of Mars in orbit around Mars. Then once it's in orbit around Mars, the idea is to send a spacecraft to pick up the thing in orbit, to rendezvous, and bring it back to Earth. And then you have to get it back down to Earth. So with if you're doing asteroid, if you're bring, trying to get an asteroid in orbit around Earth, all you have to do is retrieve it and bring it back into orbit around Earth or the Moon. And that's a lot easier than going to Mars, getting something off the surface of Mars, getting it in orbit around Mars, bringing it back to Earth, because it's really hard to get things back from Mars. That requires a lot of rocket fuel. Right. So I think if you can put it in orbit around Earth and then launch astronauts to it or, or robots, I think you've saved yourself a lot of rocket fuel and a lot of time. And then also you have something that's um, analog uh, um, very similar to something that might come hit us, that might come kill us all. So I think there's a, a lot of interest in studying our rowdy neighbors and these potentially hazardous objects before they come find us. Right. They, they, and they, would, they would break some human speed records coming back if they came back from direct from solar orbit to reentry without any kind of slowing down. So that would yeah. Yeah. That'd be bad. Some people are like, why can't we just crash them onto the surface of the Earth? I'm like, Cause, yeah. Because that's, you know... How how populations die. Remember, wasn't it, <laughs> the Gen wasn't it Genesis Stardust that crashed into the Utah desert a few years ago? I, I think the uh, yeah. the preferred term is litho breaking. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you have the lithosphere of the Earth, that's the outer part of the Earth, rather than aero breaking or <laughs> atmospheric <laughs> breaking. So the. Uh, <laughs> I was at a conference actually a couple of years ago when they were talking about sample return and planetary protection. And they were saying that, you know, you might as well, if these systems are going to fail, you might as well just design these reentry vehicles to crash land in your desert. Yeah. Because that saves you the parachute, it saves you a lot of weight and a lot of complexity. And the simpler you make these things, the higher chance it is that they'll succeed. <laughs> Litho breaking was definitely my favorite term of the week when I learned it a couple months that's, ago. That's a good one. Yeah. All right, well, we've got a question about uh, asteroids. So uh, Christine Grossfinner on Google Plus wants to know, if Dawn can land on Vesta, why is the sample return so difficult by comparison? I don't think Dawn landed on Vesta. Land. Yeah. No, it, it, it was in orbit for a while, and right. Dawn is going on to orbit Ceres. Hay Hayabusa did. Well, it, it came and kind of touched down on Itakawa, I think it was. And it sent, it's accidentally ejected its lander too soon or too late, yeah, so it's, yeah. its lander missed the asteroid. Yeah. But they're going to try again with Hayabusa 2. Wasn't, wasn't it near Shoe Shoemaker? Or, uh, there, there was a, a spacecraft that landed on, I think, Eros or something, touched down very briefly. I can't remember the name of the mission. And we're actually sending a spacecraft to asteroid Bennu, which was formerly known as yeah, 1999 yeah. RQ-36. I we love that you know the names of asteroids like that. <laughs> <laughs> when I first started this job, I was just like, oh my god, how are you just th throwing around three-letter acronyms with these numbers on them? How do you keep them all straight? And I'm like, oh yeah, KW4, HW1. And after a couple of months, you sort of memorize them all. Because <laughs> it's like, oh yes, I'm looking at this one. Or, um, so they're sending the spacecraft OSIRIS-REx to um, asteroid Bennu, which was recently named. And asteroid Bennu is interesting because it's a potentially hazardous asteroid. It might come hit Earth. And they're actually going to scoop up some parts of it and bring it back to Earth at some point for study. So this is really big because... Um, Hayabusa, when it brought back samples to the Earth, it was just a couple of grains. They were expecting a lot more, yeah, a couple they didn't of grams. Know they, had they didn't even know if they had anything. Yeah. And amazingly enough, they brought back pieces of this LL equilibrated chondrite. It has been, been predicted 10 years ago. So rock on Hayabusa. And there have been comet grain. Uh, there have been uh, 
uh, parts of other bodies have been brought back to Earth, but that just hasn't, has not been very much. So this OSIRIS-REx project is actually going to bring back a significant chunk of this asteroid for study. Right. And that's um, also kind of cool. Okay, we've got one more question on asteroids. Uh, Simon Love, also on Google Quest, wants to know, um, the article that um, you, well, I post on your behalf, Sandy, uh, doesn't mention how close of an orbit NASA is aiming for. Uh, could an asteroid be wrangled into an orbit close enough to Earth to collect or destroy some of the space debris that is already starting to pose a danger to uh, orbital flight? Well, I think the problem is if you have it, uh, if you bring an asteroid that close to uh, pose a danger to space debris, you also have the problem that there's a lot of atmosphere up there and that these astro an asteroid in that orbit, its orbit would decay enough to fall into Earth at some point. So again, that would sort of defeat the purpose of bringing an asteroid home if it's just going to crash land into Earth. I think the orbit that people are talking about when they're saying bringing an asteroid, uh, redirecting an asteroid closer to Earth is to put it in orbit around the moon. And I... I I think um, that's probably a pretty safe place to put things. Because so I saw, and I, I think I would don't know where this article is, but I did write an article about this mission once that said that they were thinking about putting an asteroid into one of the Lagrange points, so sort of anchoring it somewhere in the vicinity of the moon, but in a, a spot where it wouldn't actually ever come close enough at all to the Earth. But also, um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you might. The idea is to bring back an asteroid that, if it were to fall through the Earth, it would not. It would actually just break up and not cause any problems. It wouldn't wipe us all out. Right. So is I was hearing talk of a five-meter asteroid. We were observing one in March, I think. So five meters. That's what you know. Not even you know, like that's not even twenty feet, right? That's, that's itty bitty. So that would completely that would probably break break up in our atmosphere. It would be a nice pretty fireball, but it would not pose a danger to you. It would definitely pose a danger. It would be more hazardous in the <laughs> asteroid than to you. Thinking about QE two and talking about dawn, it didn't happen with Vesta, but I'm always curious. It's not out of the question when it goes to Ceres in twenty fifteen, I think, that you know, Ceres could have a moon, could have a few moons. And it's always possible that we were kind of wondering that when Dawn went into orbit around Vesta, you know, we're like, it's not out of the realm of possibility that it may discover some small moons there orbiting it. But with Ceres, too, that would be kind of interesting. Yeah, there's, that's what the cool thing about studying the solar system. I think astronomy in general, you, you go out looking for something and you find something completely new and exciting in the process. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so speaking of things that are new and exciting, sort of bad segue, I tried. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> let's look at the uh, not not so new anymore uh, mission of Shenzhou 10. Um, they've been up in orbit for what a week and three. In about a week, now? yeah. This, this so mission is 15 home. days. They're they're coming back. They're returning June 25th. Uh, and it, they'll probably broadcast it. They did the last uh, Shenzhou mission that went to Tiangong 1. Uh, I was surprised for as closed as the, the Chinese space program usually is. They're actually with their manned missions. They've been broadcasting quite a bit. I've been checking on their uh, on their C their Chinese CNTV every day, and they've been putting up new videos. There was a full length video that uh, Wang Yaoping, the the one woman taikonaut that's up there right now, that she did a whole lesson up in space on zero g. Uh, about 40 minutes long, and they broadcast the whole thing. I watched it yesterday. It was kind of interesting, actually. But this is the last mission. I just realized too that they're not sending another crewed mission up to Tiangong One. Uh, they're going. They're they're thinking of building a more a larger mirror type modular space station by 2020. The Chinese are, but this one was kind of a test. So these two crews are the only crews they're putting up there right now. And Tiangong One, compared to the International Space Station, is not big. It's about the size of a school bus. It's like a if you see the the video of it. It's like just a large room, kind of. It's not. Uh, it's like a one-room apartment, basically, that they're floating in. It's uh, compared to the International Space Station. That's like a five-bedroom house, pretty much. It's it's a much larger area. She accidentally uh, answered a question we had had on Twitter before about Tiangong One about whether they have windows or not, because you never see that in the video. It's like, is that just a windowless room? Apparently, they do have some small porthole windows on the space station. So that, to me, I would always think that's a bummer if you go into space and there's like nowhere to look out. It's like, what what good well, is that? You want that view. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, so yeah, do you, do you know what, um, what the next stage of the space there, I don't know what it's going to be called, but the future space station is either going to look like or 
more or less its time frame. I, I think all I've seen idea, is that it's coming down. The idea is that one's going to come down on a command reentry, and they're building something that's going to be along the size, kind of intermediary between Tiangong-1 and the ISS, kind of like Mirror, where it's going to be modular units that are almost connected together, like maybe like two or three Tiangong-1s connected together on a central hub. They've got to do the old Mir style cobbled together, the, the kind of Tinker Toy set. They don't have a, a space shuttle like we did to build our International Space Station. So it's going to be much smaller. But I know they have ambitions to go to the moon and even Mars, too. So, And, uh, you know, we don't have a, a capability for manned crewed space flight from the U.S. right now. So in a way, they're kind of ahead of us temporarily <laughs> anyway. It's only yeah. Russia and China have the ability to send people into space right now. At least SpaceX is working on it and a few other uh, projects we've got on the drawing board, but we don't have anything on the launch pad to send people into space right now. No, and we're, um, at least from what I've seen recently, we're still a little bit a ways away from getting those rockets, man-rated rockets on the launch pad. So Yeah, we're, we're kind yeah. of in that lean decade, kind of like we had between uh, Apollo and the shuttle. Right. right at least, yeah. At least there was a def definitive. I feel like there was more of a definitive plan at, uh, yeah, between. At least, at least we have a manned presence in space right now. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's unusual that we don't have a shuttle or an Apollo or anything like that, but we have an international space station with people in it. And a lot yeah. of people don't know that, that there are still humans in space. We've been in space permanently for the last decade uh, in a continuous kind of occupation of space. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, and before before we leave uh, Shenzhou 10, there's this great picture um, that I Thierry, how do you pronounce his last Thierry name? Thierry Legault, I'm pretty Legault, sure. Legault, yes. Uh, he snapped. I'm gonna try to screen share and see if I can uh, make this one work. I did. Yeah, I see it. I, okay. Oh, we got the sunspot group that's on the sun. Yeah. Today. Do you want me to? I, here, I, I can take it up to the full shot. I don't think you can see the station at all in there, but... I, I see it as a spec. Yeah, you can so see it a lot better in the bottom one. Yeah, you do can you want actually... to narrate? <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you, can, you can actually see... It looks like the little TIE fighter. If you're looking down below that big sunspot group that's off to the center right, I'm looking at on Google+, Plus. it will be flipped for everybody, so it'll be center left. And there's a little TIE fighter-looking object right there. You're seeing the solar panels are the, are the panel sides, in one side is the Shenzhou module that looks very much like Soyuz. Their, their, their spacecraft are based on Soyuz, as a matter of fact. And the other side is the Tiangong-1, which is maybe twice the size of the Shenzhou-10. But to take this kind of image, I've done this sort of thing before, and it's very... He, he is a master astrophotographer. Uh, he probably had to travel to get it, because when you're looking for... The, you've really got a plan and know exactly when... If you've ever watched the ISS pass over, you know how quick it moves. And when it's crossing the sun like that, it's crossing in less than half a second visually. So you really have to know exactly, you have to have your GPS and know exactly where it's going to happen. There's probably a path of maybe like 10 kilometers that he had to place himself in. And of course it has to be clear because the sun's got to be out, so you've got to be able to image the sun. I've seen the International Space Station transit and I've actually got images of it. The International Space Station is easier because it's about 40 arc seconds in size or so, about the size of Saturn with its rings visually. Tiangong-1 is tiny, it's about maybe five to eight arc seconds. So to get that kind of resolution, he probably had, I believe he uses a refractor with the ca imaging camera hooked up to it, and he's tracking that aimed at the sun, and you have to know precisely when it's going to pass in front. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult shot to do. More than likely, like I said, he had to probably travel a ways to get it. He had to know, I usually, I have an alert system through a system called CalSky Online, that you can actually have it predict when and alert you when there are going to be transits of the International Space Station or other satellites in front of the sun or the moon or near planets. And it's very rare, but every couple of years I have one. If you wait, if you sit and wait in your backyard for these kind of things, you'd have to wait maybe, uh, I think living here in Florida for five years, I've once had a transit of the International Space Station in front of the sun that I've seen. So it's uh, hmm. it's it's a difficult thing to achieve. And he, I think, was the one a few years ago that got a photo of the partially eclipsed sun with the International Space Station transiting in front of it. Yeah, I think that was during the last, the solar eclipse, the angular it, eclipse in the States, that there was, wasn't that one? Or was it the it transit of Venus that I was thinking of? It, it got I, someone did the, the ISS and the transit too. of Venus. Yes. That takes Just a lot. amazing. Of, that takes a lot of planning. I believe he, yeah. he had to travel for that one of the partial eclipse a few years ago 
somewhere in Oman, I believe. He he looked and calculated. So he 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 lives it's in France, but he bought yeah. the airline ticket just for that half a second worth of transit to get the image. But it's an awesome image. Um, all right, and before before we leave uh, Chinese space flight and the Taikonauts, we've got a question um, from Chibi on YouTube. Uh, wants to know since China recently used their Taikonauts and their test space uh, space platform, excuse me, to broadcast science lessons direct to schools. Um, he wants to know if we how what what are our thoughts about them using a test mission that way to sort of do education from space. Uh, well, I, I think it's kind of cool they're doing that. Like I said, is my own thoughts about it. Is I think it's it's cool considering what we we're saying before that their space program has been much more closed than it had been before. I think it's really cool that it's almost unprecedented that they're they're showing so much of what's going on right now, kind of what we're used to nowadays. Um, you know, it's interesting when the when they're doing the Soyuz reentries from the ISS. We've talked on Twitter before that, you know, during the Cold War, this used to all go on in secret. You never saw this stuff. So it was interesting. To me, it's always fascinating to watch how the Russians do things now and think back to when I was younger. And it's like, you know, we would just hear weeks later that, oh, they had a mission or, oh, they went up and did something. Now we're all seeing it real time. So I think it's cool the Chinese are, are uh, kind of, uh, there was a lot of speculation of whether they would do most of their missions in secret, but it's, uh, it's kind of cool they're actually opening up and showing what they're doing. Yeah, it's um, it's sort of a model that we don't think about. That yeah, space space flight and being able to see launches live and all this stuff. It's not. This wasn't how it was for a really long time. It's a sort of in, a new generation of space flight that it's yeah. very accessible to I, everyone. I like with the Russian launches. You never have with the shuttle. They have the in cabin view all the way up. When they're launching, you see it right. Uh, you mm -hmm. get the live view from the Soyuz capsule as they're launching in the shuttle, you never really got that. You got some images, but you didn't get it like right during the launch. You didn't get a live feed. So I think that's kind of cool they do that. And I've seen the inside of the Soyuz trainer at Johnson Space Flight Center. It's tiny. It's amazing how tiny they, they cram three people in, into the size of something about maybe a little bigger than the front cab of an SUV. <laughs> it's, it's a tiny space. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, space Flight, seeing it in real time. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so speaking of seeing really awesome things in space, uh, still David here, <laughs> Cassini is about to do something very cool. Not that orbiting yeah, Saturn everybody... and doing all kinds of stuff is very cool anyways. Um, is that Sandy leaving or do you have something? No, it's waving. No, we're waving oh. to we're all supposed to wave. <laughs> or uh, smile or something. I'm a Nate getter. Um, yes, so Cassini is going to take a pretty spectacular picture of the Earth. Do you want to give yes. us a little bit about yeah. how it that's going to happen? It is going to take another pale blue dot picture like uh, Voyager did when it was looking back during the uh, Carl Sagan era when we had it turn yeah. back toward the inner solar system and Try image the Earth. And Cassini did a pale blue dot image a few years ago where it looked back and caught the Earth as a, as a little pixel. But this will be the first time that we know in advance that they're going to actually take the picture. Before, we'd always heard about it afterwards and seen the picture. This time, there's been advanced warning. It's going to be on July 19th at 5.27 to 5. Oh, she's back. Got kicked out. Screen share does right. to me every time. Yeah. Sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah, July 19th, Cassini will be looking back at Earth and will be imaging the Earth and will show up as one tiny pixel in its frame. Uh, it's unfortunate I was looking at the time and the geometry of this uh, from the East Coast anyway. We're going to be visually in the picture, North and South America. Of course, it's not you're not going to see the continents because it's going to look as one it's earth is going to register as one blue pixel but it's kind of the thought that we're actually going to be looking at it from europe in that area it'll be nighttime already so they can i think it's going to be cool at that time frame to actually look back at saturn you know and say because saturn is currently visible in the evening sky in the constellation virgo very near uh the star spica so you'll be able to you can go out tonight and see saturn in july you'll still see it too I always thought it would be cool that evening if it had been dark here a few hours later to actually observe Saturn at that time. You won't see Cassini, it's too tiny, but just the, just the thought. And it's always amazing with these kind of blue dot pictures to look back and think that's, that's all of humanity you're looking at. Everybody that's, I think it was Carl Sagan that was saying on the first pill blue dot picture that everybody that ever was or, well, not say ever will be if we leave the planet, maybe not. 
but everything that's transpired in all of human history transpired on that pixel back there. It's really kind of humbling to look at. Yeah, it's definitely one of those fascinating perspective pictures. They're kind of unbelievable. Um, is there any, can we see Cassini from the Earth at all? With you like a massive telescope? No, no it's, it's way no too idea. small. It's way too small. You wouldn't yeah. see it. Uh, it's been there since 2000, early 2003, 2004. 2003, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's been returning some outstanding science. So it launched in 99, I believe it was. 98, 99, somewhere in that time frame. So it's it's still going strong out there. So it's it's uh, it's one of the few outer solar system spacecraft still operating. New Horizons is on its way out to Pluto, and we're still hearing back from the Voyagers. And Juno is heading toward Jupiter. But other than that, there's no spacecraft leaving the Earth uh, this year I know of for uh, any beyond Earth orbit missions, any interplanetary missions. So it's, it's we're we're, we're in the threat of going radio dark out there once Cassini ends its mission. We're not going to have any spacecraft out in that area pretty soon. I uh, just want to share a comment because I think this is kind of <laughs> uh, brilliant. Is James Haney on Google Plus, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, uh, suggests that we all put on our fancy dress clothes and have a worldwide class photo. Tallest <laughs> in the back, shortest in the front. See who, <laughs> see who we can see from Saturn. Um, that would be that'd be nice. It'd be like hands across America for a new generation. <laughs> Oh yeah. Except yeah. Well, I'm going to show up as one pixel. Yeah, it's yeah. We're going to have to have a super high resolution pixel or something. <laughs> you know, I've never seen the moon show up in any of these, um, and it, it it may just possibly. You know, the the moon may be just bright enough that it might produce a pixel of its own. I, I've seen I mean, so that. what what's the angular resolution? I mean, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you're that far away. I don't think you're going to be able to resolve the moon at that point. Well, thinking back, when when we're looking at Saturn from here, like I said, it's about 40, 45 arc seconds across, I believe. So Saturn, you could think how much tinier is Earth than Saturn. To think in, in Angular, being observational backyard guy, I always think of arc seconds and arc minutes for how big something might be. It's got to be probably less than 10 arc seconds across the Earth from out there. Do either of you guys know um, off the top of your heads, or if anybody watching does, put it in a comment, where Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 was when it took that pale blue dot picture? Is it looking through... Was it from about the area of Saturn? No, it was out. I have, is it six way billion I have no... uh, six it billion was... kilometers. So how far out is six billion kilometers? That's it, a lot of kilometers. It, six billion. It, it was. It was after they had done the the Uranus and Neptune flyby. Oh, so that's forty okay. forty astronomical units. So that's way out. That's there. way that's out there. Pluto and okay. Neptune. Pluto at perihelion is, I think, toward 39 astronomical Right. Planets, so. so it'll look bigger than it does in that sort of classic pale blue dot picture, but probably not by much. It'll be the pale blue pixel. Um, <laughs> yeah. As James Haney points out, yes, but it'll be a fine-looking pixel. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we've got one, one more thing to talk about this week, and that is just some upcoming launches and neat things to look forward to that we will probably be talking about on next, or... Not, maybe not next week, but future weekly space hangouts. So, David, do you want to give us a, a quick rundown? A, there's a scattering of launches coming up, the usual satellite communications launches, but I think some of the interesting science payloads coming up. Uh, June 27th, IRIS, the Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph, is launching out of Vandenberg. And I think what's interesting with these is they're launching this one off uh, uh, the belly of an L-1011 aircraft on a Pegasus rocket. They're actually taking it up, suspended from the aircraft, and then they're going to deploy it from the air. There was another mission a few years ago, oh, New Star, that launched the same way. That's an X-ray telescope that went up into orbit. Those are kind of nifty to watch. You can watch it online. NASA will probably carry it. And India is launching a navigation satellite uh, on a be, to be determined date on their PSLV rocket later in June. And it's kind of interesting to watch their space program. They have some ambitions to send some, uh, they've sent a few probes up to the moon and even conceivably start doing some manned missions by 2015 as well. But they've been broadcasting their launches, so it's interesting to watch India. Uh, in one launch, I think it's going to be interesting. You're going to hear a lot more about his laddie out of Wallops, out of NASA Wallops on September 5th. That's going to be a night launch, so it's going to be visible from a few hundred miles around. And unlike most of the launches out of Wallops, they're just doing suborbital uh, test rockets and things like this. This one is going to the moon. 
this is a dust experiment measurement uh, spacecraft that's going to actually orbit the moon, but it's going out of going out of uh, NASA wallops on the Virginia East Coast. It's going to be visible to millions of people, so I think it's going to be a very high interest launch. We see them down here all the time, so it's unfortunately they're not launching the shuttle out of Florida anymore. But you could see the shuttle from hundreds of miles away when they used to launch it, especially at nighttime. Here, it was very dramatic. Yeah, those are always the best launch pictures. The night launches. There's a huge, I can only imagine, I've never seen the Apollo launches in person, but I can only imagine how awesome they must have been from the Space Coast here when they went off. Because yeah. there, there's, a, there's a huge difference between a shuttle launch, and I like the little like Delta launches and the things like SpaceX, but they're tiny firecrackers compared to the shuttle. When the shuttle went up, it was, it was especially at nighttime, it was amazing. Yeah, well, what I always loved is watching all the old footage of the Saturn Vs, and they go so slowly, and you watch a shuttle, and it's just like, pop. Goes right up. Yeah. It's pretty. It's pretty different. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's uh, see if anybody, anybody on Google Plus, Twitter, or YouTube has any final questions for the crew. Um, and do you guys have anything else you want to add about neat things coming up in space this week that we could maybe look forward to talk about next week? The Kickstarter for ARCID, the uh, space uh -huh. the People Space Telescope, yeah, has been funded. So they're hoping to raise one point five or one point six million dollars. And if you wait just one second. Uh, get uh, a link that someone sent me in Japanese of a video. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's sort of ridiculous. Um, it's about the most Japanese thing you will see all week. <laughs> it's got like the little okay. chibi space telescope and it's like dancing back and forth. I haven't, the audio is, uh, I don't know, if you speak Japanese, it's um, pretty fantastic. So I just put it in the chat, Amy. Yeah, I'll put this up on the Cosmo the uh, event page to everyone. So I have no idea who made it, where it came from, but it's uh, it's one of the more silly things you'll see with regard to uh, um, crowdfunded space telescopes. I think they just passed a million. Yeah, they did just pass a million, so the thing's actually funded. If they get two million, they'll start looking for exoplanets. I don't know if that's going to happen before July first, but that would be pretty cool if it did. It's, uh, uh... If they make they make 1.5 million. They have another goal there. Yeah, I think it's twenty. Something good to come out of Kickstarter yeah. this week. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. It's I think it's twenty five dollars to get the selfie picture that they're going to take uh, once they launch it. So that's a very interesting project. Yeah, so they will build it. Yay! I, I saw something awesome. about if they. Yeah, if they make another forty thousand dollars, they'll. We can all change yeah. our Twitter icons to our selfies when they come up. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's know how you know it'll be up, because everyone on Twitter will have them in background in space. I, I wonder how many creative photos people will take, like with the with their Superman outfit on, like on the. <laughs> nice. Uh, Guido Bibra wants to know, or is asking whether he thinks there's a spacewalk scheduled on the ISS for Monday. Is that the case? I have yeah. no idea. There could be. I haven't heard about that, but I, there there could well be. I, I think it's uh, probably a scheduled one, not a contingency one, but there there, there could well be one coming up. I know Shinjo, uh, the Tiangong one, they're doing uh, undocking and redocking today. I haven't looked on the news to see if they've done it. They're, what they're doing is they're testing their manual. They always dock automated, but they're they're testing their manual docking technology. So I know today they were supposed to undock and then redock again just to see if they could do it. And cool. if they can't, they'll probably be coming back today. There's always that possibility. Yeah. <laughs> they're suited up, and whenever they do those kind of tests, they're suited up and ready. So ready in go. the event they can't redock, they may be coming back. But that's right. just a contingency thing. Right. All right. Well, um, I think that probably wraps us up because we're just about at an hour. So everyone watching, thanks for bearing with us as we had shaky sea legs when we got started. Um, okay, so Sandy, where can people find out more about you and about your work? I am at Sondi on Twitter. It's going to be an exciting next couple of weeks. We have 40 hours of observing, and hopefully the telescope works. <laughs> Always nice 40 hours of zapping, <laughs> zapping asteroids with 20 terawatts of radar. Yeah. All right, and David, where can people find uh, out more about you and your work? I am Astro Guys with the Z on Twitter, YouTube, and my own blog. And I can be found mostly, I'm mostly active on Universe Today, Sometimes on Canada.com, sometimes on Listasaur, and I have an article that just came out in Sky and Telescope on social media and astronomy. So awesome, <laughs> very nice. Um, all right, and I am Amy Shearer Title. Did not 
say much this week, but you can find all my space history writings on my blog, Vintage Space. I'm also at Discovery News, uh, Al Jazeera English, Scientific American, and um, Motherboard and Device. And Google Plus and Twitter is AST Vintage Space. Um, so thanks very much for watching, everybody, and we will be back, hopefully, with a more seasoned uh, host next week. Uh, have a great weekend. All right. You too.